Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Izukanji Sikazwe with the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia, also known as CIDES, together with the co-editor, Anna Grinsrod from the International AIDS Society. Joining us via video will be the third co-editor for this supplement, Peter Ehrenkraus from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, supplement launch and we're really, really excited to be doing this. As you know, this is the differentiated service delivery for HIV during COVID-19, lessons and opportunities. There has been a lot of work done with differentiated service delivery for HIV services, and COVID provided us with an opportunity to expand what we've learned. As you know, with our COVID-19 outbreak, there was a lot of restrictions and lockdown in terms of um, movement that, could, uh, that potentially affected the delivery of HIV services. We explored, we explored through the supplement ways in which we're able to innovate. I'd like to thank um, the um, authors for the different manuscripts, the 11 articles in this um, manuscript that we'll go through this afternoon. Next slide. So briefly, uh, this is how the session is set out for today. Uh, we have four presentations from four of the authors that are that provided original research articles to the supplement. All this work with the original uh, research is set on the African continent. And as you're aware, this is the continent that is most affected by HIV. We'll be hearing from PrEP access for female sex workers, the experience from Zimbabwe. And then we'll, we'll hear about changes in utilization for DSD for HIV treatment here in Zambia. And then DSD for people on second line antiretroviral therapy, the experience from KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. And then finally, we'll hear from an earlier referral to community services for DSD, the experience from uh, Lesotho and Zimbabwe. Finally, we'll have um, the editorial summary being given by Peter Ehrenkress, which is Silver Linings How HIV COVID 19 Expedited Differentiated Service Delivery for HIV. Thereafter, we, we invite you all to join in our discussion. We'll have a live Q&A session, and we're privileged to be joined by Nelson Otwoma from National Empower Empowerment Network of People Living with HIV AIDS in Kenya. And uh, we're really glad to have him here and join us for the discussion as well as the Q&A session. Please do make use of the chat as well as the Q&A buttons to submit your questions. Next slide. So I'll briefly go over through uh, the commentary that is included in the supplement. This commentary is on tuberculosis treatment within differentiated service delivery models in the global HIV TB programming. This commentary is provided to us by Tran and others. As you know, TB remains one of the biggest killers and reasons for mor morbidity for patients living with HIV. In as much as we've been able to innovate for HIV itself, we haven't uh, pushed the envelope when it comes to tuberculosis. So this commentary expand, explores ways in which lessons learned from HIV DSD could be integrated and applied to TB treatment programs. There is a case study from Zambia that shows the implementation of such a framework of uh, TB HIV integration using DSD models. Next slide, and I'll hand you over to my co-editor, Anna. Over to you, Anna. Great, thanks so much, Izukanji. So just quickly to run you through the other articles that will be in the supplement, we have a paper from the United States, the United States, which shows that in the treatment program from Veteran Affairs, we saw a reduction in the number of clinical visits and an increase in the duration of antiretroviral supplies provided in the United States, highlighting that DSD isn't just for resource limited settings. Next slide. We also have two papers from uh, beyond the Afro region, one from Bangkok, Thailand, and one from India. In the manuscript from Thailand, from IHRI, uh, we see how the integration of telehealth supported same-day 
ART initiation and looked at innovations for early treatment in that context through telehealth. In the work from India, there were focus group discussions with key populations about COVID and HIV, and they found that participants were really appreciative of the adaptations made such that they could continue services, including multi-month dispensing or MMD, as well as home and community-based ART delivery. Next slide. In other data from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we have a paper from Nigeria, which looked at the scale up of access to DSD that was really pushed and accelerated due to COVID. The authors conclude that the movement restrictions, physical distancing requirements, supply chain disruptions, and financial difficulties as a result of the pandemic necessitated transitioning people to out of facility or community-based models. Um, and this is exciting because we haven't seen a lot of DSD data published from Nigeria before. And then in work through colleagues from FHI 360 in Botswana, they looked at two different models using private pharmacies for ART refills for public sector clients, as well as home delivery of treatment for um, people in the public system and looked at the acceptability and feasibility of these two models. Next. The final paper in this supplement is a short report based on data from 21 PEPFAR countries. And they really looked at the rapid scale up of multi-month dispensing from um, October, 2019 through to the end of 2020. And what's really exciting and important to highlight here is that both three to six month refills or three to five month refills and six month refills have accelerated over time. Here, I've just shown table two, which is the proportion and absolute number of all adults. But as you can see in the red block, the acceleration for multi-month dispensing was even higher for those under 15 years of age. And so we saw this same trend for children and adolescents. Next. So with that, I just want to say welcome again. We really hope you enjoy these presentations. Please do put your questions into the Q&A. And if you see other questions in the Q&A that you have um, that are also of interest to you, make sure you give them a digital thumbs up so that we can prioritize that um, during our 30 minute um, discussion at the end of these presentations. Thanks very much. And we'll see you after the presentations. Hello, my name is Primrose Matambanazo with the Center for Sexual Health and HIV AIDS Research. And I'll be presenting our work on PrEP access for female sex workers in Zimbabwe during covid 19 lockdown, where we had community-based delivery, extended PrEP refills and virtual support. And I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my co-authors as shown there. So the Sisters with Voice program offers sexual and reproductive health services for sex workers across the country in 61 sites in 10 provinces. And we offered services to more than 26,000 female sex workers in 2020. In Zimbabwe's PrEP program, following adoption of the WHO guidelines to include oral PrEP in 2016 and some demonstration projects, the country adopted the PrEP implementation plan in 2018. And we rolled out PrEP services within the SISTERS program in 2019. We hypothesized that peer-led community-based provision of PrEP services influenced both the demand and the supply of PrEP uptake. And our data was collected from female sex workers receiving services within facilities of the SISTERS program. We've included aggregated anonymized individual clinic data of 19,407 female sex workers who presented at sisters clinics and tested HIV negative. And of those, we initiated 6,539 on PrEP. We mapped PrEP uptake in four periods prior to the lockdown, which happened at the end of March, 2020, during the most severe restrictions subsequent to those easing of those restrictions between July and September 2020, and also then during some drug stockouts that followed toward the end of the year. So in terms of our results, PrEP uptake rates, the initiation rate had averaged about 25% prior to the COVID lockdown. And we began to see an increase when we introduced the adaptations in April, 2020. And by 
September 2020, the initiation rate had reached a peak of 51%. That was 1,360 initiations of female sex workers. This really was an unexpected rise that placed demand on the commodity pipeline, but also with pressures on that pipeline from COVID-19 interruptions. We experienced national commodity shortages between October and December 2020, and we had to prioritize refills over new initiations in that period. So overall in 2020, we had an uptake of 33.7% of those that had been screened, and the highest was among the age group 20 to 24 years at 33%. When we mapped this data within the SISTERS program against the national PrEP data, our contribution to national PrEP initiations at the start of the year were between uh, January and April was 16%. Following the COVID lockdown, we had initially experienced a drop in PrEP initiations as had the national program. And the recovery of the SISTERS program seems to have really been much stronger than that of the national program with other implementing partners and within the public sector, suggesting the effectiveness of the adaptations. And we contributed 63% to those initiations in that period to December 2020. Our continuation rates, retention at one month was at 40% and dropping to 27% uh, with 1,509 at three months and down to 14% at six months. So it was suboptimal at the end. And what were the adaptations to our PrEP program? Chiefly, they were where we delivered PrEP. Previously, it had only been at our clinics and at drop-in centers. And we moved this to taking PrEP to where the sex workers were in the community and being able to initiate them there. Additionally, teams were expanded to not just be nurses who were chiefly responsible for these tasks across screening up to follow up, but to also have tasks carried out by outreach workers and micro planners who are peer educators trained to give differentiated support. These were now assisting in arranging community visits to initiate PrEP and to follow up and also providing virtual follow up as well. So the summary of our adaptations for the scale up that happened during COVID-19 is this empowering of the community cadres. They were really empowered to educate the peers and create demand for PrEP. And also this increase in the access points as I've just been describing with some task sharing. The scaled up telehealth was really useful for supporting for side effects and supporting adherence in a time where we were decongesting clinics and in-person visits were less possible also with movement restrictions. These were delivered via phone and WhatsApp. We had increased virtual peer support through WhatsApp broadcast lists that were created for these micro planners. And they were also supported in administering these by the outreach workers. On these groups, there would be conversations to dispel prep myths, encourage uptake and adherence, and also respond to concerns that were arising. Enabling multi-month dispensing of prep was also key providing three months at a time and no longer having to have monthly clinic visits to correct resupply. So with some strengths and limitations, there was, it seemed, greater risk perception by sex workers during COVID-19 uh, and of their HIV risk due to various reasons. They had to have riskier practices with reduced access to clients during this time due to closure of venues and restrictions on movement. And this may have affected their openness to PrEP as an alternative prevention strategy. There also was lower mobility during COVID-19 lockdowns. We often have sex workers migrate internally within Zimbabwe and also move out of Zimbabwe to other locations in search of work, which often makes it more difficult to reach them, initiate from PrEP and also have good continuation rates. So, what are we planning with the next steps? This adapted PrEP model has remained in place in 2021, and we've now been focusing on identifying what lessons we have for implementation following restoration of the commodity supply. This has now been restored and normalized 
in the second quarter of 2021. And we're working on being able to document this peer-led model, what works, what job aids the peers use in their provision of uh, information on PrEP and creating demand and how this can be adopted for long-term use. We are also focusing not just on the numbers because we've seen that there was massive increase in uptake and generally that has been sustained, but we're working on improving the quality of the services provided and the support that's provided so that those that take PrEP are adequately supported for adverse events and any concerns that are arising, even when they are having fewer clinic visits and are supported in the community and at home. And we're hoping that improving this quality will also improve the continuation rates. Sex workers are considered to stay at high risk as long as they're active in sex work. And we would like to see for those active in sex work, higher continuation rates above the one month, 40% we saw during this period, looking at this data, um, hoping to improve it to 60% and above at least at one month and maintaining it after that. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, we are very excited to present about our work on changes in utilization of DSD for HIV treatment during COVID-19 in Zambia. My name is Young Jijo at Boston University and... My, my name is Ben Spirio, a researcher from Clinton Health Access Initiative in Zambia. And we are presenting on behalf of MB team. Uh, in our group, and we would like to acknowledge it to the support of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Zambia Ministry of Health for this study. So first, Babis will cover background and method, and I'm going to cover the result and conclusion section. So I will hand over to Babis. Thank you very much, Angie. So in terms of the background, uh, from the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in the early 20, 2020, uh, we saw an increase in contacts of differentiated service delivery for HIV treatment. Um, and as we all know, DSD models can minimize the need for in-person interaction between patient and providers. So in March 2020, the Zambia Ministry of Health urgently promoted the expansion of three and six month dispensing for patients uh, who are on ART. So we use National Electronic Medical Records, Smart Care, uh, data to chart the expansion of DST mod model participation during the pandemic. The aim of um, this uh, evaluation was to evaluate the extent to which DST coverage and ART dispensing intervals changed during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic in Zambia. Uh, looking at the methodology, so in terms of our data source, uh, we were using smart care records um, uh, where we had 266,580 patient records uh, from 791 health facilities across 93 districts of Zambia, which has 10 provinces. 10 provinces. And um, this represented uh, a third of all ART patients nationally. And uh, our time of interest was January 2019 to November 2020. In terms of analysis, we were able to assess the rate of increase of the cumulative numbers uh, of patients enrolled in DSD models before and after March 2020 using the interrupted time series analysis. So in terms of DSD models included, we had, um, so we had the facet-based models, which are fast track and multi as well as community-based uh, models, which included community adherence groups, home IT delivery, and also other um, models such as before and after hours, just to mention a few. Uh, we compare the change in slope between the cumulative number of clients enrolled in DST before and after March 1st, 2020. Segmented regression model um, as seen in the slide, where time is in months and COVID is a dummy variable indicating whether the current time is pre or post COVID. Uh, in terms of DST outcome is the cumulative number of clients enrolled in DST at time T. Um, beta 3 indicates a slope change following the um, intervention. Then when it comes to uh, the results, uh, on my right, you'll be able to see uh, the cumulative number of patients enrolled in DST graph uh, for the period of our interest, which is 2019 to 2020. 
And we see the number of patients enrolled in DFD module gradually increased over this period, especially in uh, multi-month dispensing and fast track. While the number of patients served by the home ART delivery model is modest, so it increased most rapid, rapidly during this period uh, uh, with about 240%. Uh, while participation in community adherence groups increased uh, the least with only 18%. So proportion of patients receiving six-month dispensing fell from 57% to just below 50% with 49%. Proportion receiving one, two, and three months refuse, uh, we see that it rose. Then I'll hand over um, to Yangji to continue with the results. So thank you. So as you saw the graphs, the DSD model has been continuously increasing over the last two years, but we wanted to assess whether and to what extent the slope has been changed before and after COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is uh, March 1st, 2020, uh, which is the first day that the Zambia uh, COVID-19 case was uh, notified. So based on the interactive time series analysis, uh, we applied that to each DSD model, and we found that the participation in home ART delivery and fast track one, two months, and multi-month dispensing for three months, the slope has been significantly increased after March 2020. But on the other hand, the participation in fast track four to six months and others model, were, the slope was significantly decreased. In case of fast track three months, the slope were non-significantly increased, but you see the immediate level change on March 2020. So overall, uh, we found through this analysis that COVID-19 pandemic showed accelerated new participation in most DSD model, especially shorter months dispensing, but less increase in the longer months dispensing, such as four to six months fast track and others model. There are some limitations in our study, which are we relied entirely on routinely collected medical record data from the smart care system, which covers three quarters of Zambia's uh, all ART facilities. So some other facilities which uh, do not use the smart care EMR system, which uh, generally may be located in rural area, may have some different uh, patterns. This analysis does not illustrate how and why the introduction of COVID-19 resulted in different scale of patterns by DSD models and whether and to what extent the temporal changes may differ by setting. So in conclusion, further research is needed to examine how this rapid acceleration of different DSD model uptake has affected overall initiation and retention in care of entire ART cohort, including patients not meeting criteria for stability. An effort to eliminate obstacles to longer dispensing interval should be prioritized to achieve the expected benefits of DSD model and minimize COVID-19 risk. So for example, other studies uh, from PEPAR, they show that the generally increasing three to six months dispensing in total uh, from 2019 at 46% to 69% in 2020. So this suggests that there are increasing, uh, expected increasing demand in longer months dispensing over time, even though there were uh, immediate uh, uh, more uptake in the shorter months dispensing for new patients. So a secure supply chain will remain essential. As government is now recommending relaxation of eligibility criteria for multi-month dispensing, even for the new patients, uh, new, new stable patients, in evalu uh, evaluating the impact of the evolution in DSD guidelines will be a high priority for the coming years. So uh, with that, uh, we want to thank you for uh, listening our presentation. So thank you very much for inviting us to present our work as part of the differentiated service delivery for HIV during COVID-19 JIS supplement. Our paper is entitled Differentiated Service Delivery for People on Second Line Antiretroviral Therapy, Evidence from KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. I'm Gentry Dorwood and I'm presenting on behalf of our co-authors who are listed here. So a bit of background, people living with HIV who are receiving second line antiretroviral therapy or ART have not always been included in differentiated service delivery programs, 
and there is little data evaluating their outcomes in these programs. South Africa implemented a community-based differentiated ART delivery program in 2016, and this program did include people receiving second line ART as long as they had viral suppression. So therefore, we use data from South Africa to assess treatment outcomes among people on second line ART in a community delivery program compared to those who remained at clinic. This was a retrospective cohort study of people receiving second line ART and eligible for community ART delivery between October 2016 and December 2018. To be eligible for community ART delivery, a patient needed to have two suppressed viral loads more than six months apart, to have been stable on ART, uh, so on the second line ART regimen for more than 12 months, and to not have any clinical conditions that needed regular clinical uh, review. We used routinely collected data from 61 primary care clinics in South Africa. You can see the clinic areas in the map on the right. And we analyzed the data using multivariable logistic regression models to compare attrition and viremia at 12 months among those who, who were referred for community ART versus those who remained in clinic care. So these are our results. There were 2,575 people on second line ART and potentially eligible for community ART delivery. If you look at the participant flowchart on the right in the top two boxes, you can see that from the original data set, uh, a lot of people were on first line ART. And, on, and then of those who were on second line ART, many had not been on it for more than one year, or they did not have a suppressed viral load at baseline or in the preceding two years, meaning they were not eligible. So this left us with the 2,575 people who were eligible for the program. Amongst this group, the median age was 39 years and 65% were women. Of this group who were potentially eligible for the community ART program, uh, 584, so just under one quarter, were referred for community ART within six months of meeting eligibility criteria. So the other 1,991, although they were eligible, they remained in, in clinic care. And this allowed us to compare outcomes between the two groups. So this is quite a busy slide. It's showing the baseline characteristics and some follow-up characteristics among the participants. But really, I just want to highlight that overall, the two groups were very similar. So those who were referred into community ART and those who remained at the clinic were very similar. Apart from there were more who remained at the clinic in the first year of the program in 2016. And the CD4 counts were slightly lower in those who remained at the clinic compared to those who were referred for community ART. Overall, in this cohort of people who were on second line ART and eligible for community ART delivery, attrition at 12 months was very low. So those who were referred for community ART had 12 month attrition of 4.5% and it was only 4.4% in the clinic care arm and you can see the confidence intervals overlap. Again, with viremia at 12 months, this was low. It was 10% in the community ART arm and 11% in the clinic care arm and the confidence intervals again overlap. We then compared uh, the outcomes formally uh, using multivariable logistic regression. So this is the model for attrition. And you can see after adjusting for age, gender, district, the year of baseline observation and the NRTI backbone and the months on treatment, um, there was still no difference in uh, attrition at 12 months among those on second line regimens who were referred to community ART compared to those who remained in clinic care and the adjusted odds ratio was 1.02. Looking at the multivariable logistic regression model of viremia, again uh, adjusting for the same variables, there was no difference in viremia at 12 months among those on second line regimens referred to community ART compared to those who remained in clinic care and adjusted odds ratio was 0.91. We performed a couple of sensitivity analyses. If you remember, because the CD4 counts were not quite balanced at baseline, we did a sensitivity analysis adjusting for CD4 counts. There was quite a lot of missing data for the CD4 count, which is why it wasn't included in, in the main model. But in this sensitivity analysis, again, there was no difference in 12 month attrition and no difference in 12 month viremia between the two groups. In another sensitivity analysis, which uh, included clients who were transferred out to another clinic, attrition was lower in the community ART group compared to those in clinic care. So the adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.73 and the confidence interval just below one. So in summary, this is one of the largest and first analyses to assess outcomes among people on second line ART in a differentiated community ART delivery program. And in this uh, 
group overall and amongst those who were referred in the community ART delivery program, there was high retention in viral suppression. However, we must acknowledge that people who are referred for community ART may have been selected by clinicians because they are likely to have better outcomes. And so while we did adjust for baseline variables, there may be some unaccounted for confounding. Also, these findings are from before the COVID-19 and since uh, in the last few years, the South African differentiated service delivery eligibility criteria are now less strict, meaning people who are in this program now may have slightly different characteristics compared to those in this analysis. So our next steps, firstly, we think that programs which do not already include second line treatments and differentiated ART delivery services should consider introducing them for people who are virally suppressed. And this fits nicely with the 2021 revised WHO guidelines where their definition of established on treatment includes people on second and third line regimens. From a research perspective, we now want to look at longer term outcome data beyond 12 months and during the COVID-19 pandemic to see if there have been any changes. So thank you very much for listening. I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators at the Etegui Municipality Health Unit in Caprisa and the University of Oxford, and also our funders at the International Aid Society, Fast Track Cities Program and the Wellcome Trust. Thank you. Thank you for coming to this presentation. My name is Trish Muzenda and I am based at the University of Cambridge. I'll be presenting on a study titled Early Referral to a Community-Based TSD for HIV with Multi-Month Dispensing and Annual Clinical Visits, data from two cluster randomized trials in Lesotho and Zimbabwe. Next slide. Multi-month dispensing with antiretroviral treatment is an enabler of differentiated service delivery for HIV treatment models for people established on on ART or rather stable patients. DSD models, including MMD, have had good outcomes for patients who have been established on ART for 12 months or longer, but there isn't much regarding patients who are newly stable. Broadly, MMD involves patients coming to the clinic less often, and so they have less clinical oversight. Now, this is of particular interest in the current context of COVID-19 because MMD, Firstly, reduce patient load in healthcare facilities, thereby enabling COVID-19 social distancing measures. And secondly, they reduce unnecessary visits to facilities for people on ART. Now, despite these reported benefits, there is not much data in terms of firstly, understanding MMD effectiveness amongst those newly stable on ART that is commencing in MMD. MMD less than 12 months after ART initiation, and secondly, ART outcomes amongst patients receiving annual clinical consultations. Next slide. We use um, clin we used individual level participant data from newly stable um, adults um, enrolled in two clinical in two cluster randomized trials in Lesotho and Zimbabwe. Our primary outcome was the retention in ARTK 12 months after enrollment and with two secondary outcomes, which were viral suppression and the number of unscheduled clinic visits 12 months after enrollment. Next slide. We had three study arms. Uh, firstly was the standard of care or control arm. And this arm um, looked at, this uh, looked at, um, this is whereby ART was provided three monthly at, at clinical facilities, as well as clinical consultations were also conducted three monthly. Then we had two intervention arms, three MC and six MC. So now in the, um, for the three MC, um, patients received um, at three monthly in community art groups, which is a number of six to 12 groups. And, and this was the same for um, the, second intervention, but patients receive the ART, um, ART treatment every six months in these community, community art groups. Um, for both intervention arms, patients um, only had one annual facility visit with clinical consultations. We use individual level regression analysis to look at our, to, to look at our study findings. Thank you, next slide. So overall, 599 people were recruited into the study, and these um, people evenly spread across the different arms. All the baseline characteristics, age, film, age, gender, as well as um, duration on AR team were similar across the board, although we noted that they were very small, we had very small numbers in the age category of 18 to 24 years. Next slide. 
Now, the primary outcome for our study was the number of people in ART retained in each arms at 12 months. Looking at our table here, we found that retention was quite similar across the arms with 93% and the control group and above 95% for both intervention arms. We then look at the risk difference, which essentially looks at the absolute differences in retention across the different study arms. And we found that when compared to the control arm, the adjusted risk differences um, were 4.5% and 1.5% for the 3MC and 6MC respectively. Next slide. Now for this figure, it is important to note that this was a non-inferiority trial with the aim to investigate if the two intervention arms were non-inferior to the standard of care, which is the control group. The non-inferior margin is indicated by the dotted line to your left, was minus 3.25%, and the null value for the risk difference was zero, which is indicated by the dotted line to the right. So two things are important to note in this particular figure. Firstly, the non-inferior margin line, which is minus 3.25 here, and secondly, the lower confidence intervals for each of the intervention lines, uh, which is the 3MC versus standard of care and the 6MC versus standard of care. Now, if the lowest confidence interval is higher than the non-inferiority confidence margin, then you can say that the intervention is in fact non-inferior compared to the control. And in this case, we can see that for both 3MC and 6MC, the lower end of the confidence intervals are both higher than the non-inferior margin. And in fact, for the first line, uh, which is the 3MC versus standard of care, you can also see that the lower confidence interval for 3MC is higher than the now. And therefore, 3MC is actually superior to the standard of care for this particular comparison. Next slide. Our two secondary outcomes were viral suppression in unscheduled facility visits. All participants were eligible um, for, for viral load testing um, if they reached 12 months of the study and, and were not lost to follow up, um, had died, or had transferred out. And, <clears throat> And now looking at the percentage tested, we, know that we noted that the percentage tested was relatively lower in the in two intervention arms compared to the control. And the reason for this is because um, viral, load testing wasn't, uh, viral load testing infrastructure wasn't complete in both countries at the time of the study. Um, um, now looking at the viral load suppression, this was high above 98% across the study arms, which is good. We also calculated the risk ratio for um, 3MC and 6MC relative to the control. And because both, um, and both ratios were close to the null, we can infer that <clears throat> there was no difference in viral load suppression across these arms. Our last outcome, which is associated with facility visits, <clears throat> we found that um, during, we found that um, we measured the number of facility visits for each individual. And we found that during the first 12 months, the, the average number of unscheduled visits per patient was below one across the study arms. And this indicates that on average, people had less than one unscheduled visit, which more or less translated they almost had no unscheduled visits. Then we also looked at the incidence rate ratio uh, in comparison to the standard of care model. And we found that um, the incidence rate was low for both um, intervention arms, 3MC and 6MC. Many unscheduled visits were lower in the intervention groups, uh, uh, lower in the intervention groups compared to the control. But the control intervals, um, the, the confidence intervals um, crossed one, indicating that uh, the p-values were non-significant. And, so and so in essence, the incidence rate of unscheduled visits was not different across the arms. Next slide. Our study, um, one of our study strengths was that this was a randomized control um, study it was a randomized design across 60 facilities in two countries, and we had three limitations pertaining to the relatively low sample size, um, the sample size of um, those aged between 18 to 24 being particularly low, and also the viral load, test, uh, viral load um, testing was not available across all, the stat across all the clinical facilities. Next slide. Our key takeaway is that community-centered DST models are non-inferior to standard of care and that annual clinical visits are, were also non-inferior to three monthly clinical consultations. Therefore, in the context of COVID-19, DST models should be considered for scale up as they uh, reduce patient load um, in clinical facilities, whilst at the same time, uh, patients also benefit from not having to travel to, um, to facilities thereby reducing the exposure to COVID-19 infection. 
Um, in terms of future in terms of future research, um, we noted that the numbers of the people in the youngest age group, 18 to 24, were particularly very low, and so we cannot extrapolate our overall study findings to this group. Therefore, there is need for further research um, to ascertain if out of facility DSD models effectively retain newly stable ART patients in this in this age group. Next slide. Would I like to acknowledge our following partners and funders? Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Aaron Krantz. I'm a deputy director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the TB and HIV team. I'm speaking to you today from Seattle about how COVID-19 accelerated innovation and scale of differentiated service delivery for HIV. We're all very aware of the remarkable and continuing toll from the pandemic. As of the third week of October, 2021, there have been more than 250 million infections and 5 million deaths, with likely an undercount for much of the African region, which is shown at the very bottom of this figure in sort of the darker blue color. Yet there are some silver linings to be found, even during this terribly challenging time. The supplement we're launching seeks to capture a small portion of the lessons learned and opportunities provided by the COVID pandemic as related to HIV services. In Sub-Saharan Africa, which was the source for most of the articles in our supplement, many countries have experienced an increased strain on their existing health infrastructure. National programs and implementers have responded by rapidly innovating on how services are delivered. And some of these innovations may prove to be better than the old normal. So as this author suggests, before we rush back to normal, let's take time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. In the supplement, we uncovered six themes of silver linings from responses to the COVID-19 pandemic that we think have positively accelerated the movement towards delivering high quality person-centered HIV services. You've heard about a few already today, but I'm gonna take the next couple of minutes to recap, categorize them and suggest some ways forward. Number one, virtual support on mobile phones can accelerate ART initiation and facilitate monitoring in facilities and communities. In response to COVID-19, Many digital platforms were utilized to reduce the need for in-person delivery of services. We saw programs from all over the world, South Africa, the United States, Thailand, use telehealth and video conferencing to provide care to people needing testing, prevention, ART initiation, and treatment services. Such use of digital innovations will continue to be required as HIV programs strive to provide high quality services in a manner that is more person-centered than healthcare worker-centered. Number two, expanded concept of eligibility for less intensive models to include people with as little as six months on ART, children and adolescents less than 15 years old, and those on second line regimens. The definition of who is established on care or stable was discussed at length at the recent WHO guideline service delivery meetings. But COVID has moved that theoretical discussion into quite practical matters. These shifts in eligibility criteria mean that people who are previously excluded from differentiated models of ART delivery can now access it. And if the data and outcomes continues to be positive, one would hope that these adaptations will become permanent. Number three, extended ART refill durations and maybe extended duration between clinical visits to six or more months should be a new standard of care. This is a related theme. Increased duration of multi-month dispensing which is just one critical aspect of any less intense ART delivery model, was the most consistent change to ART services during the first year of the pandemic. Refills were spread out to six months in many settings. And in addition, some studies showed non-inferior outcomes with annual clinical visits. Both of these data points are promising markers of a trend to more person-centered care that could be hard to reverse as the pandemic moves to a less acute state. Number four, COVID-19 has emphasized the importance of expanding access to community-based service, excuse me, community-based services. This theme also builds on the last two themes. In some cases, more person-centered care means that the health service is brought closer to the individual seeking care. This can mean community adherence clubs or different ways of delivering medicines to individuals, such as using the postal service to make home deliveries or engaging private pharmacies to provide refills. Number five, DSD for HIV is also relevant in more highly resourced settings. This is likely no surprise to this audience, but all of the innovations described in the supplement are considered person-centered and acceptable in settings with more resources as well. Number six, DSD is applicable for HIV prevention and other vertical programs. This theme is particularly exciting for me 
During the pandemic, we've seen increased discussion and sometimes documentation of the use of DSD concepts for other parts of the HIV care continuum, including PrEP, but also tuberculosis, excuse me, tuberculosis prevention and treatment services, family planning, and even non-communicable diseases. All of these services can benefit from the core concepts of differentiated service delivery, the separation of clinical visits from refill visits, and a reconsideration of where, when, and by whom different types of services should be provided, be they in-person interactions, telemedicine, or postal deliveries. To further advance this trend to person-centered or self-care that has been accelerated by COVID-19, we need evaluations of routine data, quality improvement collaboratives, and even focused implementation science studies on the themes that I've described in the previous slides. To give some examples of questions these, these evaluations should ask, to what extent can virtual support using mobile phones encourage adherence and provide documentation of engagement as clinical and refill visits become less intense? less frequent? Should anyone be restricted from access to less intense models of ART delivery? And I particularly want to call out the importance of providing access to less intense models of care for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Are annual clinical visits sufficient for people established on ART? Should they be the new standard of care? How soon after initiating ART should people living with HIV become eligible for multi-month refills? Do they really need to wait six months or even 12 months? And what is the ideal duration of a multi-month refill? Could it also be annual? How can we use the lessons from differentiated ART services to support re-engagement in care and provide prevention services like PrEP? And how can we coordinate HIV treatment services with other vertical programs, family planning, TB, non-communicable diseases, and particularly address issues relating to coordination of supply chain and m and &E systems? When these studies are done, key indicators should include not only clinical outcomes, but also individual and healthcare worker experience, as well as cost to both the patients and the health system. I will conclude by asking if there are more silver linings to come. If we are truly interested in providing person-centered care, COVID-19 has provided an opportunity to apply the concepts of DSD models to more than just ART delivery. And you can see here the concept of a DSD 2.0 that I put forth with some colleagues earlier this year. It includes coordination of HIV care with services for TB, family planning, NCDs, and we left an other box on the bottom as we know that other considerations will come up depending on the local context. Achieving this goal of DSD 2.0 would require a true rethinking of how healthcare is delivered to provide high quality person-centered care. For people living with HIV as pictured in the middle of the circle on the right, but also eventually for people regardless of HIV status. This is a big lift but COVID-19 has given some more momentum towards getting there. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the presenters for the brilliant presentations of the original abstracts to this, uh, to this uh, JIS supplement. At this point, you will see on, uh, on your screens there, a poll, which is really reflections from the audience. I ask that you take some time to give us a quick feedback and let us know what you think around COVID-19 and HIV services. Please cast your vote. Thank you. Anna, as the, uh, our participants are taking the poll, any quick reflections? Yeah, so first I just wanna say thank you to all of those who asked questions and kept all of us busy um, during the, the pre-recorded presentations. Um, I think that what is really interesting is that we were able to highlight um, some adaptations made both to prep and to treatment, um, also to um, ensure access for people who are on second line, and also to show some really interesting outcomes from, outcomes from the trial data um, from the situ in, in Zimbabwe um, around community models and um, ART 
clinical consultations only once a year, so moving beyond WHO guidelines. I wanted to take this moment to um, ask others to join us on the virtual stage. So ask um, Nelson, as well as all the presenters to go ahead and turn your videos on and so that um, Zuzu and I can see you. Um, and then as we see you, we'll know that you're fully listening and ready to engage for our questions. Um, Primrose, you got a lot of questions in the chat um, about PrEP and PrEP access in Zimbabwe. Um, what do you, what is your key takeaway from, uh, from the last 18 months um, from the SESHAR program? I think a key takeaway was that having the community cadres lead the mobilization and demand creation will create rapid uptake increase. The difficulty um, is in continue at that high uptake level when your uh, cohort increases rapidly. And also there's pressures that it creates on the demand. So it's important yeah, it that- is this, It is this. It's ahead, important that Sorry. data is being fed into the national system uh, promptly so that that also helps with requantification where that's necessary. Uh, before, we, before we move over Primrose, just very quickly, uh, what do you think can be done as you continue to scale up of your intervention to improve ret retention of PrEP in your cohorts because you have this rapid decline in retention, particularly at four months? So we've seen the experience now in this year that we do need to have much more active follow-up across uh, the different types of CADA with the nurses giving initial follow-up for side effects and any adverse events. And at, at one week, even doing those phone calls in the community, having locator forms. One of the issues for low retention was mobility. When things opened up and the sex workers started to be able to move around again. So being able to have several uh, bits of locator information, contact numbers, that we can then be able to locate them and deliver PrEP to them where they are. And that helped to now increase continuation rates in this year. Okay, good. Nelson, I know you're having challenges with your camera. Are you able to come in and give us some of your reflections on uh, the supplement and the summaries that have been presented by the different authors? Hi, Nelson, you're still on mute. Well, I think we'll wait for sorry, Nelson. Sorry for, sorry for that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. And uh, I was still struggling with my video, but looks like the camera is a challenge, but I can come in with my voice, hoping yes, that my voice, my voice will do it. So um, I just have a few points of reflections uh, very quickly before I go into the presenters. And the points I have for reflection is that when COVID came in, I think it came with a lot of anxiety and fear. Uh, particularly among people who are on treatment, those who are HIV who are on treatment, there were many questions where, uh, whether services were going to continue the way they are. And there were reports that uh, doctors, clinicians were deployed to COVID and uh, there was nobody to attend to uh, HIV. But luckily for Kenya, uh, the discussions around uh, differentiated service delivery had started. And of course, uh, here we had about how criteria was, it was restrictive and uh, quite a number of populations who are not eligible. For example, in Kenya, we are talking more of a, a community ART group, which is still limited, but also the fast track and uh, multi-month uh, dispensing. And uh, yeah, so that is it. That, that is what is it. Uh, now from Kenyan perspective, even before you go into the presentation that we have here that very much uh, collaborate with uh, what uh, present has made, I think uh, I want to borrow that line that it was a silver lining for DSD and, and it gave it impetus and, and, and main people. The eligibility criteria was reviewed quickly and uh, many people uh, then joined. But uh, specifically on the presentations, I want to appreciate and applaud the teams that have worked on researches and programs that today have given us lessons and which we are going to have into the IS uh, 
journal, and I'm happy that I'll be joining the, its launch. Uh, starting with the overview that Anna gave and also what we were learning from uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, the prep with the sex workers, and so on and so forth. I think uh, in, in, in short, we need uh, differentiated service delivery and particularly uh, community-based models and uh, giving of ARVs that is for relatively longer period of time so that we defeat the curfews, we defeat the fears of going to the hospital for refill and, and so on and so forth. So as I've always said before in DSD forums, uh, this is uh, there's compelling evidence and we cannot ignore DSD uh, in any emergency and also during COVID. I also need to move quickly and say that, uh, yes, criteria were revised very quickly and uh, people put in for the benefit of recipients of care. And I think one thing that COVID compromised was the input and uh, the needs of recipients of care, uh, with the discussions. So this is where one area where I think uh, the benefit was because the Ministry of Health took the initiativeness. But I'm saying that now with the countries where COVID is slowing down, I think we need to really go back to the dialogue of uh, in, uh, building capacity and introducing people to the concept and, and letting people know what we are talking about so that people don't say that uh, uh, we are being kept away from hospital because of COVID. We don't want people to say, we want people to understand why are we giving longer term period and uh, there are reasons for that. And we want people to understand why we are strengthening communities and uh, making sure that they also take up role uh, the responsibility of having treatment and care. Now, uh, when it comes to community ART groups, I think we still need to do a lot of capacity building and popularizing them so that people take charge, uh, take charge of them. And I'm happy that uh, the presenters also talked about this. And I uh, think what we also need, uh, my last point is to Actually, I have two last points. The second, the last one is uh, we need to check, have, have ways of linking HIV programs with social protection. People may be picking ARVs and probably not religiously using them. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, in one of the studies, virtual suppression was higher, but uh, we are yet to do more analysis like in the Kenyan case. So we need to link. Uh, HIV program with the social protection so people have the livelihood and the food that they need to ensure that they are here to their treatment. The last point is uh, really to be keen where HIV co-infections and comorbidities come in. Uh, here I'm happy that uh, TB has been mentioned, but also other non-communicable -communicab diseases. We need to make sure that as people probably are in community groups and as people are, we are staying longer in home to go for a viral load, they are managing the other conditions well and are adhering to what other appointments may be there. And I think that is the point of integration. And for the Kenyan case, and probably this is a sub-Saharan African case, and my last point is to always make sure that commodities and supplies, including lab reagents, are available in a predictable and sustainable manner. I think in 2020, Kenya did very well by sustaining over 1 million people on treatment without any interruption. And in 2021, although COVID was still there, we experienced challenges and it is like we were almost folding up our DSD long uh, multi-month prescription. And it is not because of COVID, it is because of lack of predictable and sustainable ARVs and, and also uh, ensuring that people can access uh, tests and lab tests in particular for viral load. Thank you very much for giving me time to speak. I can come back in later. Thank you, Nelson. Um, Anna, do you wanna ask a couple of questions? We have a few that have not been responded to in the chat and I think they're cross-cutting that perhaps different uh, presenters could try and take a stab at. Sure, that sounds good. Um, I know that there's a couple of questions to um, Trish on the one study. So we'll get back to you because I know that she had to drop off early. So apologies for that. 
Um, maybe a question here um, to those of you who are still with us would be, to what extent do you think that the research outcomes you found in your work are applicable to people from key populations? So we didn't have, um, in terms of HIV treatment outcomes, we didn't have any um, work done specifically for key populations published in this um, supplement, but I wonder, Jianxi, and then maybe over, over to Bevis and Yongji, if you could speak a little bit about what you think um, in response to that question. Uh, thank you, Anna. I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you, everyone, for attending and for the interest. Um, I think uh, just looking at our, our data, we had 35% were, were men, um, but we didn't have any, as you say, further data on, on high-risk populations within, within the people on second line. I think traditionally people on second line have, have thought to be at clinically higher risk in general. And so I think the main message that, that we had was in this cohort of people who fitted the criteria, they all did really, really well in, in the community ART program. And we had a lot of people who dropped off, uh, sorry, who weren't eligible for the program because they didn't have two consecutive suppressed viral loads or they hadn't been on second line for long enough. Um, and so in South Africa now, the, the guidelines have changed a bit more relaxed. You can be referred after being for, on treatment for only six months. You only need one suppressed viral load. And so um, now there'll be many more people who are eligible for, for this program. So I think that, that will be interesting to see whether these people who are on second line, are they really at, at higher risk if they fit those criteria? Um, and I suppose the last thing to say is that um, people on second line who don't have suppressed viral loads are also at a clinically a high risk population and whether differentiated programs could actually help them because if the problem is people can't get to clinic to collect their treatment on their second line treatment, if you can provide it nearer to home or in a more convenient way, then, then maybe that would, would also help. So I think that's a real research question that needs to be looked at. Can we design uh, models of care for people who aren't doing so well on treatment that do make it easier rather than more difficult to, to, to continue to take treatment? Thank you. Thanks. I want to quickly interrupt and see if Trish um, is able to just respond quickly um, and give a little bit of more context around the trial work before she jumps off. Are you available to unmute? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm just available for a few, but yes, I can take questions. So Trish, there was a great question here around how people were randomized um, into the study and whether or not the recipients of care had choice into what DSD model or whether the randomization was at the level of the clinic. Um, and they were, um, if they were eligible, that's where they ended up going. Um, yes, so the randomization, um, so it was a cluster randomized trial and the randomization occurred at the level of the clinic. Um, with regards to um, the patient, um, whether the patients have uh, had a choice, I'd have to check in with um, my, one of the other um, authors for our paper who was more heavily involved in that and they can better answer to that section. Great, thanks very much. Um, just looking through the chat here, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna end the poll and I think the answers will then come up online and maybe um, Bevis here, let's look at this first one together. You'll see that in the opinion of 75 plus percent of the audience, COVID did lead to an acceleration of DSD for HIV as well as encouraged innovations. What has your experience been uh, in Zambia in this regard? Would you agree with the majority of the audience? Yeah, definitely. Um, after the COVID um, situation came through, we kind of, um, like you've noticed even from the study we just presented, we kind of saw a surge in the uptake uh, of uh, DSD model, particularly um, those that require less uh, visits to the clinics. And so because of the social distancing aspect that has to come with, with uh, regards to uh, reducing the infectious rate. So we saw an increase uh, in the uptake of DSD model as well as um, the DSD models being encouraged uh, uh, by the different partners as well as the Ministry of Health uh, to just um, help out with uh, reducing the infection rate around the COVID situation and also um, to increase the uptake in terms of antiretroviral treatment. So it kind of yeah, did uh, contribute to that uh, in the aspect of Zambia. Then uh, also commenting on the, um, the earlier question about how these uh, results or how are they applicable to 
to high risk populations, uh, particularly could be men. Um, these are very much applicable. Um, as we know, high risk men um, from the situation in Zambia tend to most of the time shun away from the health facilities, uh, even just going for you. Uh, for regular checkups and so forth. Um, so with the coming in of the GST models where for some models where they get to peak and uh, uh, get to be seen uh, by the healthcare workers uh, less often, uh, actually encourage uh, the high risk uh, men uh, to kind of uh, get on um, those models that fit them and uh, that are more beneficial to them in terms of uh, avoiding some of the things that they might be avoiding uh, going regular to the health facilities. Thank you. So Anna, if I can just ask very quickly, you know, there's a question I think they're trying to get at, trying to understand uh, whether there's resources or equipment available for DSD um, implementation. I think at facility or uh, within the community, or is there needs to outsource the resources that you need to implement DSD services? So perhaps maybe um, Lorraine or Yongi or uh, Jay, she couldn't respond to that. So do you think there are enough resources available at facility or community level? to actually implement DSD services. I don't know who wants to go first. Yogi, do you wanna go first? But you're muted. Um, well, I think to my knowledge, the most important resource to be ensured is the supply chain of the ART. So, uh, because that's uh, the, the most uh, barriers for the uptake of uh, uh, DSD model. So maybe I want to re-emphasize the, the, the supply chain uh, management for ART. But maybe for the community-based delivery, uh, some DSD model may require other type of resources and maybe babies can share some other insights. Okay. Jenji, you got your, oh, I can see Bevis's hand up as well. I'm thinking maybe he wants to jump in. <laughs> sure. Go ahead, Dennis. All right, thank you. Yeah, so um, in addition to what Yanja has mentioned, um, um, there is need, but it also depends with the type of models uh, that are at the facility level, and that has the highest number of uh, recipients of care um, uh, subscribing to. So uh, there are some models that do not really require any additional resources, but just realignment of human resource and also task shifting. And uh, there are some that do require intensive uh, resources or equipment. Um, so it is vital for us to do an analysis or an evaluation to see if those models that um, do require a lot of equipment and supply and resources are actually uh, preferred and are yielding the best outcomes compared to those that are less uh, resource um, or that require less resources uh, to be implemented. So that evaluation will be important for us to assess whether there's need to continue pumping in resources into the different GSD models. Thank you. Good. Yes, Gentry, your hand is raised. You can go ahead and unmute. <laughs> Uh, just quickly to add from the, uh, the, the program in South Africa is um, kind of partially outsourced. So it's a, a private sector company who do the centralized um, dispensing and the distribution. And then the pickup points can vary from community groups to also private pharmacies. So again, there's, there's different resources um, needs there. I think there was an interesting kind of short, short letter from um, uh, Ingrid Bassett and uh, Jana Jaradamova looking at what resources were needed at the pickup points during COVID and finding that actually people who were collecting from clinics, the staff of the clinics were kind of better resourced in terms of PPE and space for social distancing compared to community pickup points where actually they weren't maybe so well prepared to cope with the demands of COVID, not, not, the, not the delivery of the ART, but the specifics around COVID. All right. 
There is an interesting question here in that, you know, the DSD models so far mainly concentrate on, on people that are adherent and suppressed. What about those that are unstable, especially the, those that were diagnosed during the outbreak, the COVID outbreak? And I think if Nelson is online, I think he's dropped off. I was, I was going to ask Nelson to give us his thoughts around, you know, what is it that we're doing for those that are not stable or those that may have advanced disease, but perhaps maybe going with Primrose, um, if she's comfortable enough to step in and give her thoughts and then have one or two others contribute around their thoughts on how to address uh, clients that may not be virally, be virally suppressed or termed as unstable. Primrose, are you still available? Yes, I'm available. This is not really my area, but we do have sex workers within the SISTERS program who were diagnosed in the past year and are not virally suppressed. And it is, they will not have the same model of let's say community art refill groups for which the criteria traditionally has been viral load suppression. But we found you can offer them differentiated service by setting up groups to support them and ensure they attend all their enhanced adherence counseling sessions and then uh, support return to adherence following uh, that and then the repeat viral load test. And we have found that that helps uh, improve their adherence and then at the next test that they are virally suppressed. So you can target support for those that are with high viral loads. Thank you. Okay. I know the supplement has um, uh, an article from the US Veterans Affairs where they use um, telemedicine or telehealth as a DSD model and what they kept for their in-person uh, interactions with uh, clients, so people living with HIV that were newly diagnosed or had, uh, uh, were unstable or with advanced disease. And even for those that did still offer them some uh, telemedicine uh, platforms for more frequent interaction or engagement with the healthcare system. So perhaps that's one paper that um, uh, those that are interested could take a look at to see how they addressed people with uh, advanced disease. I think the other point to highlight in all of this is that we've seen a huge shift and, and uh, Lauren Bailey, who's on the call and the PEPFAR data really shows a shift in the scale up of multi-month dispensing. And we need to break potentially this idea that, you know, people who have advanced HIV disease, we should give them short drug refills to make sure that they come back. We've got to stop using the drugs as a stick to force them to come back to the facilities, right? Um, I think that there's alternative ways to encourage, um, encourage people to come. Um, and it's, you know, DSD, as has been noted, was, you know, has focused on people who are established on ART. But as Jianchi mentioned earlier, with some of the second line recipients of care and their research, it doesn't always make sense um, to see, unless you're offering clinical services, ensuring that people come back regularly may in fact be a barrier to retention. So we need to kind of find that balance. Um, I also just wanted to um, comment a little bit to say that um, we will get back to the people who have posted questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, and maybe just um, in the last two minutes, ask my colleagues to bring up our final slides that we have for all of you. Um, to say that, as has been noted, all the presentations will be made are available as well as the recording of this um, webinar today. Um, and we will also be sharing with all of you the link to the full supplement download, which is going to be available at the end of the week. Um, you can go to the next slide. I also just want to say that if you're interested in more webinars, we'll put some links in the chat here to a series that we're working on with um, the Sequin Network that's hosted at ICAP at Columbia University and the IAS on implementing the WHO's 2021 service delivery recommendations from guidelines to reality. That's forthcoming. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, just want to say that there's a number of resources that we put together on differentiatedservicedelivery.org for those looking for more implementation guidance, evidence summary, um, and research from other places. 
And the final slide here is really just to thank all of you and to acknowledge um, everyone who contributed to this series and contributed to the journal. So thanks a lot to Izukanji um, and to Peter Ehrenkranz as uh, my co guest editors and to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting the supplement, um, as well as to um, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, Merck Sharp and Dawn and Gilead Sciences for their support with this webinar. And with that, I'll turn over to Izzy Kanji for her final comments um, and thank all of you um, once again. Uh, really nothing for me except to, uh, to thank all the participants who joined us for this webinar and then all the uh, authors that submitted abstracts that went through the rigorous process of evaluation and actually made it to manus manuscript stage. We're really thankful to you. And then also to send our gratitude to the International Aid Society, the Journal of the International Aid Society for according us this opportunity to further gain push uh, the envelope with DSD and showcase what's been done in this space and looking forward to answering those research questions that Peter put up on his last slides. There's still lots of gaps that need to be addressed. So we're looking for more evidence to support DSD scale up and implementation. Thank you everybody. And I see the results from the poll are up and I'll hand it over to Anna maybe to run us through those very quickly. Yes, great. So just to say that the majority of you did think that COVID has led to accelerated um, scale up of DSD and encouraged innovations and for frontline providers to think differently. Uh, we also have strong supports so that there are some silver linings. And the takeaway from both questions three and four for me is that we really need more advocacy. Um, and so hopefully all of you on this call today are our allies and our supporters in this work. Um, because it's really through um, all of this evidence, but as well as telling stories um, and bringing uh, people to the center of the response that we've seen progress within HIV. So we hope that you'll be advocating within your programs, within your departments, within your ministries of health and within your communities for more differentiated service delivery for HIV and for other health conditions. Thanks very much. Have a great day further and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.